Alrighty, so we are live, we are live, and I am at Jaya Yoga Studio here in Birkenhead, Auckland. Cheers. This Cheers. Is Jennifer Allen, we have never met in person before, although Jennifer has been a part of the Yoga Lunchbox for how many years? Gosh, um, I think the first time we sat together virtually was mm -hmm. probably going on five years ago now, Yeah. Um, just before the sort of official launch of, of Jaya Yoga. Mm -hmm. We got to sit down and have a bit of a video conversation, but it's it's just absolutely wonderful to finally, finally be in your presence, Carol. Oh. Yeah, and I'm very grateful that you came out to see us in Birkenhead today. It's beautiful to come out here and see your studio, and yeah. have you, and this is rose tea, right? It's rose tea, okay, so having some tea. <laughs> it's a little bit chilly here in Auckland, so the tea is good. Mm. Okay, so Jennifer, you have been teaching yoga for how many years? This is my 16th year of Whoa. teaching. Okay. 16 years, 16 of, teaching. years of teaching. Um, I, I was an early bloomer, and I think it was just the nature of what I was doing at the time. I, I was performing professionally as, mm -hmm. uh, a, as a professional dancer and singer, and um, living in New York and doing the apartment lifestyle, and I had a yoga mat in my back, and. Um, kind of fell into teaching because I was managing a studio in New mm. York and it became just this this huge part of my my day to day it became a big part of my career and um, next thing I know I just sort of woke up and said yep this is this is what I need to be doing and started incorporating it into the work that I was doing in the theater um, just to to sort of to serve my body to serve my being to and it became so much more than that. You know, it yeah. grows, it grows, yeah. it grows, it grows, it grows over grows. the years. Um, and it's continuing to grow, um, sometimes at, at quite a rapid rate. Yeah. Um, so you were in New York in the mm. early 2000s doing yes. musical theater. Yes. And then started yoga. Riding a bike, a, yoga mat on the back. Oh yeah. Okay, so this would have been right before the big yoga explosion, right? Totally. Totally. So you were here before it happened. What was it Just like? Just before. Tell us. Um, give us the uh, New York. I remember sort of starting to see it happen. Um, I remember seeing, you know, it, it's quite it's quite common in New York to see sort of classes of 40, 45, 50 mm -hmm. people. It's quite common to see the lawyers and the Wall Street junkies walking down the street in their business suits with their mat on their back. And I, I started to see that happening. and. It became such a big part of the culture and such a big part of um, of the social part of city life as well. I think mm. there was a real there was a real sense of community around in this huge city. Yeah, a real sense of community around coming together for yoga mm -hmm. and then perhaps going, um, you know, for coffee afterwards or a meal afterwards and and. In a, in a city where you could feel quite isolated. Yeah. By there being so many people it actually made you feel like you were part of something quite small and intimate. And, mm -hmm. and I became part of a, a yoga community there that was just, I still um, keep in very close contact with the people that I taught with and the people that I practiced mm -hmm. with. And, and it did, it felt like this amazing little niche um, community that my, my partner and I became a part of as well in the midst of, um, you know, a mass of, of people and, but, but that would have been just after 9-11 as well. Yes. Right? So, yes. so I was there on 9-11. Time to be in New yeah, York. Yeah, it was a very interesting time to be in New York. Um, I was standing on the subway platform um, in Astoria, Queens, uh, watching the World Trade Centers fall. So that was quite a, um, yeah, that, well, that, that stays with you. Yeah. That will stay with me. And that was such a big part of, um, of my experiences in New York. And when I, when I look back on it, it, it shaped... Um, friendships that I made it shaped decisions that I made about the next part of my path yeah and um, yeah I will always be a New Yorker at heart mm -hmm. even though after 10 years of being in New Zealand I very much feel like um, I'm a Kiwi now yeah yeah <laughs> so if you've just joined us this is this is conversations with Carolia on the couch and today I'm speaking to Jennifer Allen from Jai Yoga in Birkenhead Auckland um, Jennifer's been running teacher training programs for the last five years. As we just yeah. discovered, she started teaching in New York in 2002. Yeah. Um, and you've got a musical theatre background. So how did you end up going from New York, musical theatre, starting to teach yoga, and then coming to New Zealand? Yeah. Well, um, gosh, if I, if I backtrack to the timeline, it, yoga and Pilates were always something that were a part of what I was doing in terms mm -hmm. of my career. 
Um, I started to see, I suffered a spine injury um, in my very early 20s, and it was a dance injury, thankfully. Um, not a yoga injury. <laughs> um, I know, I know. I like how we have to qualify that now. We do have to qualify right? that now. Because back in the days, we presumed that yoga would never injure us, but now it's like, no, it wasn't a yoga injury, it was a dance injury. Oh, we'll get yeah. to that. We'll get to that, won't we? Then, yeah. And that is such a big part of, um, that was such a big part of the birth of Jaya Yoga, actually. Yeah. Um, and so much of, of Jaya and its, its mantra around sustainable yoga is actually mm. born out of um, born out of life experience, born out of experiences that I had, um, never a regret, of course, but um, professional dancing was, was something that I, it was the other half of my life from the time that I can, you know, mm. can remember walking in ballet shoes. Um, and it became, um, it became my lifeline before yoga, and then I just watched the transformation happen after the injury. When the injury happened, I did keep performing. I kept dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked really, really hard through Pilates and through yoga to find a reconnection to my body again. And it was a safe reconnection to my body. Mm -hmm. um, and now that does shape so much of what Jaya Yoga became about for me. It became about understanding my body and moving my body in a way that felt, um, felt right. But um, So it, it really literally became about more yoga, less dancing. Mm -hmm. And it just happened in these small amounts. It was mm. like, oh, I'll do one more show. And then I'll, you know, um, but I was doing more yoga. I was going doing, yeah. you know, plenty of yoga and a little bit of theater. And then uh, a lot and more, then yoga. Lot more yoga. And, then, and, um, and it happened over, a, it was a years long span yeah. that it happened. And I still, sort of did, I still dip my toes into musical theater every now and again. Uh -huh. um, watch this space because there might be more of that happening when it's in your blood, it stays in your blood forever. Yeah. Performance, right? Forever, yeah. yeah. Um, but the transition actually was quite seamless. Mm -hmm. It was quite seamless. So what kind of yoga were you practicing and were you oh, teaching yeah. back, in the, back in the day, right? Because Jaya Yoga, you talk about it being sustainable yoga Absolutely. And, it's, and it's a specific approach to yoga. Yes. But what, where did you come from? I came from, from gosh, I, I came from, my transition from dance into yoga was still very um, movement based. Mm -hmm. So I came to yoga like a lot of people come to yoga. I came to yoga um, wanting to find a different way to move my body, mm -hmm. but it was still for me so much of it was driven by movement. Right. So it was about, um, and, and I, being in New York, and doing yoga it was vinyasa, vinyasa, vinyasa. Uh -huh. So it was, vinyasa, you know, vinyasa, vinyasa, vinyasa. 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 <laughs> that sounds like musical theater, right? It yeah. does, yeah. Vinyasa. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, it was the music and the movement and the expression. And, yeah. and I think for me that was a less, um, that was a less devastating way to look at my career and go, actually, it's time for change. Mm -hmm. I was able to see change in a much... Um, in a much more seamless way because yoga felt like dance at that time. Yep. I could express myself through mm -hmm. movement. Um, unbeknownst to, now I look back on it and I think, oh, probably should have moved that way or probably should have taken a little more time on this. Or um, I look back on it now and I see that, you know, perhaps I wasn't moving in the most mindful ways, but, but I was expressing myself through yoga. Mm -hmm. And that was a part of my path. And again, I look back with no regrets having gotten to find yoga. I mean, I found yoga in the depths of New York winters in the Bikram Studios, mm. you know? And it was the yeah. warmest place to be. Yeah, yeah. It was so cold on yeah. the subway platform that um, like, there's nothing better than yeah. to get into that hot room. So, um, yeah, it was, it was hot yoga. It was flow yoga. It was movement, movement, movement. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't ready for stillness. But yeah. I was like 20, 21, I think that was a big part of mm. my, I wasn't, I wasn't in my kapha energy yet. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't connected to that still place in myself. Mm. I was still very yang in my life and in my energy. Yeah. So when did the shift come? So you moved to New Zealand in what, oh. about 2008? <laughs> 2008. Yeah. Yeah. I moved to New Zealand. My, I, um, my husband and I had done the New York thing for a few years. We had met, um, we had met working on a cruise ship. <laughs> And so we were a cruise ship romance. Uh, <laughs> we, um, we had dated for about half a year, 
decided we wanted to be back in New York performing together. So we hopped off the ship and got married and went mm. back to New York together. And um, did that for a few years and then decided we wanted to see what was next. So we went back on ship. And, um, and then we came off the ship and we came to New Zealand and it was sort of like, well, we'll come for Christmas. We'll come and travel a bit. We'll see what it's like. And, um, and we never left. Yeah, and New we Zealand's never left. Like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, we have friends who came on a backpacking trip here and then sent for all of their stuff. And it was it was quite it was a similar experience. It was we came here. Um, I fell in love with the land straight yeah. away. Straight away. What did it feel like the land for you when you got to New it Zealand? Has it has yeah. so much. Rana. You can feel that. You like... can feel the vibration, yeah. and that was something that I had never experienced before. And and not like, I mean. There's experiences that we had in New York in terms of the energy of the people there. Mm -hmm. And I think the energy of the people here is quite spectacular as well and really quite powerful. Um, but there was something that was coming up from the land, from the earth here, that, yeah. that felt new and that felt... Um, and you know, I, th I think too they say when a, when a couple finds a place, when two partners find a place where they vibrate well together, Mm -hmm. And that happened for us almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And we started to find our sense of self here. And um, I was, of course, really still quite conflicted because I have family back in the States. And so that took quite a while. That took a few years. And um, I would say that that shift didn't really start to happen for me in terms of where I was in my yoga journey um, until I had my first child. Mm -hmm. And that was that first time that I had that first barrier of Okay, so the vinyasa practice, the movement-based practice that I had before I came into this space in myself, mm -hmm. it doesn't serve me now. Uh -huh. So it once you had a child, it was now. like, oh, I need to change my practice. It, yep, and that was, I, I can almost remember to the day, mm -hmm. and I remember I was about eight or nine weeks pregnant, mm -hmm. and I had still been, you know, getting up at moving for a couple of hours and then coming into some pranayamas and sitting with meditation and a few kind of still had a few hours in my day to mm -hmm. have to have yoga um, as a practice and it was that first day that I got up and and I was actually quite sick mm. I was quite yes quite a morning sickness Ooh, I can yeah. still remember what it yeah. felt like and that was that moment where I was like okay what can I do Mm. What can I do? And I had to open up my toolbox and I had to start pulling what I could do in the moment and what could serve me in the moment and what I actually had to start to detach from. Mm -hmm. And it became, some of it was short-term detachment. And then as I watched my body change and then after I had my child, my first child, watching my pelvis change and then mm. watching my time frames change. Yes. Everything became about then, okay, what is actually going to serve me in the moment? Mm -hmm. And when I look back on it, that was actually what shaped Jaya. Right. That was actually what shaped the mantra around um, sustainability in yoga, which we can go into in more detail. Yeah. But that was actually that moment where I realized everybody needs to have that power of choice, not just, you know, women out there who are having babies or, um, Everybody has to be able to look at their yoga practice from day to day and go, actually, what is going to serve me today? Yeah. And be okay yeah. with detaching from the rest. I think that's such yeah. a big point is that, um, I mean, so many people that I speak to around their yoga journey, they're like, I don't know what to do. I don't have time to do this. Well, this is too much for me. And so they don't have any practice mm. at home necessarily mm. because it's too mm. overwhelming and I don't have time. Yeah. But then once you start to realize that, oh, it's actually about what do I need? What do I need? What's right yeah. for me? What would serve me in this moment? What would serve me in this day? It's such a powerful shift for people to, to experience. It's that dissipation of expectation. Ooh, I, I think like that's it. the big one. Dissipation, dissipation of, of expectation. <laughs> dissipation of expectation. <laughs> um, it is. We, um, we sit on the very first weekend of teacher training and we start mm -hmm. introducing self-practice because it's a really big part of our training journey. Yeah. And I remember when I did my first 200-hour training, I think that's probably the thing that I took away that was most powerful. Mm -hmm. Was so when you, when you attended the training, yeah. that was the... Yeah, when I attended yeah. my first training. I think that was the first moment when I realized um, 
that self practice was actually was actually the core the of this work. It's yeah, the thing. It's the thing. <laughs> it's the thing. And um, and I mean, before that, I I was attached to if I don't make it to a seventy five minute class, mm -hmm. or if I don't, here's the list of poses. Yes. If I don't check off A B C D, yeah, then I haven't had my yoga. Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it is about, um, you know, being able to come each and every day to your mat and go, actually, today I just need to roll around the floor. Yeah. Oh, I like that Tomorrow one. I need a handstand. Yeah. The next day I need, you know? Yeah. And, and to have the power of choice, I think, is, is just, yeah. yeah. It's so, it's so empowering. And it, and it is a really big part of my day-to-day -day now. But also, it's a huge part of the message that, yeah. that I'm wanting to spread. To stand out there. Yeah. yeah. I know for a lot of people is that they don't do trust their own intuition. Mm. They don't trust and they know what to do. Right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it's like, but you guys, you always know what you need when you surrender and allow yourself to really listen to that. Absolutely. And, mm. and as a yoga teacher, I think that becomes about then giving, giving that kind of ownership and empowerment to your yeah. students. Because what we don't want to do as yoga teachers is we don't want to make our students only be able to come to their practice when they're with me. Mm -hmm. So I, w I want my students, I mean, codependency, I'm right? a studio owner, I love having my students come along. It yeah. is, it's a codependency, absolutely. And it is about, our, our work as teachers is actually about empowering our students to be able to yeah. find that, that power of choice in themselves. And so giving that to them in the class environment as well. well Here's some suggestions mm -hmm. on how you can move your body. Mm -hmm. How about you make the choice? Um, and I think that opens the door, but it still amazes me. It still is, amazes me the first weekend of teacher training. We sit with our self-practice and mm -hmm. I open the door out to these brand new mm -hmm. green blossoming yoga teachers to be. And, and that's probably their biggest struggle yeah. between our first and second weekends. When we meet up, they'll come back to me mm -hmm. in the second weekend and say, I just, I just found that so, such a struggle to walk away and, and you mean, you mean I really can do anything? Uh -huh. You mean I, I really can do anything? Yeah. You mean Shavasana counts. Shavasana counts. You can write it to Shavasana, Abs, you can log it in. Shavasana counts. Shavasana counts. Shavasana counts. home practice. <laughs> uh, I do it yeah. every night. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. Absolutely. So how many, like, so when you have your teacher trainees show up, how many, like what percentage, because you've done like, you know, four or five years of training, yeah. what percentage do you think have a self-practice before they start training with you? Wow, quite a small percentage. Yeah. Like yeah. less than 20%? Yeah, I would yeah. say less than 20%. Yeah. yeah. I still think um, a lot of the yogis out there that are coming into the training environment, maybe it's, maybe it's a miscommunication that we can start to dissipate mm. because maybe it's that, that there's a thought that there's an expectation from us as trainers that they need to be. Alrighty, so we are back. This is part two conversations with Karalia, speaking <laughs> with Jennifer Allen of Jaya Yoga New Zealand. We don't, we're not quite sure what happened, but it doesn't That's matter. That's right, we're, we're back. back. We're back. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> um, so we're coming to you live from Jaya Yoga Studio in Birkenhead, Auckland, where Jennifer runs all kinds of amazing yoga classes. She does her teacher training program. The next one starts early next year. Yeah. And you've also got a retreat coming up in September. We do. Do we want to talk about that now or yeah. we'll talk about it later? We can do. We can do if you like. Yeah, um, let's, let's dive yeah, in. Yeah, let's chat about it now. And if you've um, just joined us, can you give us a thumbs up or a love heart or something just to let us know how the volume is. would be awesome if the volume is all good. And so retreats. Retreat. retreat. Um, this is our second year going on retreat, actually. And um, we're heading back over to Mana in the Coromandel. Uh -huh. um, last year we opened up to our yoginis, our, our goddesses, and, um, and launched a spring awakening retreat there. So mm -hmm. um, had a wonderful, wonderful year at Mana last year and are coming back this year. We had quite a few guys asking after coming on retreat with us last year. So, um, so we're opening up our retreat this year to anybody who wants to come along. So men and women. Come on guys, come on out for your retreat. Yay. <laughs> Did we get a thumbs up? We got awesome. a volume is all good. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Shelley. Yay. <laughs> um, so this year we're theming our retreat, The Essence of Stillness. The Essence of Stillness. Essence oh, of good. Stillness. Um, 
and it's an opportunity for anyone, anyone um, from our community or otherwise to step away for three days, mm -hmm. step away into their own space of stillness and we'll be helping to facilitate that for them mm. through um, some practices of gentle asana, lots of restorative yoga, yin mm. yoga, um, breath work, meditation, mantra, um, walks in nature, massage, mm -hmm. spa treatments, whatever you're keen for. Mm -hmm. um, I think the beauty of retreat uh, is, is the opportunity, and I guess you would, you, know, you would really be embodying this with the, the retreat work that you're doing as well, Karalia. Um, giving people the opportunity to step away and have that time and space for themselves in whatever way yeah. they like. Yeah, absolutely. It's no responsibilities. You don't That's have it. to cook. That's you don't it. have to clean. You don't have to think. Oh. You don't have to go on your device. There's always someone to That's talk it. to. You can connect in real life. That's it. It's a miracle. For me, it was quite a different experience um, coming into the retreat environment with my yogis because Having come from a teacher training environment, it's, it's mm -hmm. quite different. Yeah. Um, in terms of whatever whatever expectations I may have on my my training teachers to complete homework or to be completing logbooks or to be, you know, um, accountable for certain things. There's no accountability when it comes to the retreat environment. It's literally, um, we'll open up this space for you. We will hold this space for you, mm. and. Um, and you can have this experience however you like, and it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful opportunity for people to um, come away, and I mean, we had yogis last year who just came away with a book and found a hammock, yeah. and that was how they spent their time. Mm -hmm. We had some that enjoyed getting up in the morning and having practice with us. We offer practice in the morning, in the evening. We offer um, some opportunity for some talks and lectures about things that they can um, integrate into their day-to-day, -day, into their life, that are aligned with the work that we're doing. I think that's that's the take-home the take -home experience, mm, you know? Yeah. Uh, embodying them and filling up, up our yogis with tools that they can mm -hmm. take away once the retreat is finished. Um, there were people that were really keen to have that opportunity because maybe it's not just about the three days. Maybe yeah. it's about how can I yeah. how can I find these moments of stillness in my day to day after I leave? Mm -hmm. What am I doing at the moment that I can recreate for myself? Mm -hmm. And how can I set those boundaries so that I find ten minutes? And that's all that's all we need. Yeah. Ten minutes is so empowering. Oh my god, to sit for oh. ten minutes and do, oh. and do nothing. And do yeah. nothing. And do nothing. And, and just like breathe and presence. With the dissipation of expectation. Yes, again. The dissipation of expectation. <laughs> it might be. I like it. I yeah, like it. Yeah. Um, so I love when you launched Jaya Yoga, and that's when we talked last time, yeah. I think, was when you were launching Jaya Yoga, I yeah. know, like five years ago. Yeah. Um, and you were calling it sustainable yoga, and I was like, come on, it's just a buzzword. Okay. What does it mean? What does it mean? Does it mean? Does it mean you're serving it up in some kind of biodegradable yeah. cardboard? <laughs> compost this year when you finish. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so sustainable actually it, it's I was saying to Carolia just before we began um, chatting away on, on our on our live feed that sustainable is something that has continued to grow for mm. me in such a huge way and um, so five years ago when we sort of first opened up that conversation mm. um, it had heart and it had meaning for me then but it's actually become kind of a lifeline, really, mm -hmm. now. Um, as, is, as is yoga for me in my world, it, it is a lifeline. Um, but the same sustainability aspect has grown to sort of, what began, what began as kind of a three-fold concept mm -hmm. has grown, of course, to so much more. But if I was to actually, um, if I was actually to place it into something, like when I sit with my teacher trainees and we start talking about sustainability, and I introduce mm -hmm. this concept straight away right. um, in our training, I introduce my threefold concept around sustainability and what that means around our practice. The first fold sort of covers the long term. So mm -hmm. for me, I want to have yoga for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, when I suffered my so spine, no hip replacements that's in it. Your 60s I don't want to replace anything on this body. <laughs> I don't want to replace this. This is it. I have this body in this lifetime, yeah. and it is it is 
a precious entity that is carrying yeah. around my soul. Mm. And so for me, it's about how can I take care of this for yeah. a lifetime? When I suffered the spine injury dancing, it was because I wasn't taking care. I wasn't mm. taking care. I was, um, I was pushing the boundaries. And mm -hmm. um, those who know me really, really well out there will know that that's a word that I tell my teachers they're never allowed to say in their classes. P U S H. Um, I was pushing. Pushing. Yeah. yeah. I was. I was really pushing those boundaries in my career. But that's what you do. That's what you do mm. because how much can in, we get away with, right? Oh, and of and course, I, you know, in New York as a dancer, there's a thousand other girls standing behind you waiting for your job. So yeah. you will push those boundaries. Um, but for me, it's about it's about how can I have this? How can I carry this body through yoga for the rest of my life completely injury? And I stand by that. And I know that, that that's a hard thing for us as teachers to stand by because we are not in the felt experience with our students. Yeah. All we I don't can know. We don't know. We don't, we know. don't know. But all I can do is know in myself that I'm giving it every effort yeah. to make sure that I am offering my students um, what they should be feeling, how they should be feeling it, um, how time, space, permission, mm -hmm. um, to experience their bodies and, and that I'm really present with them mm -hmm. during their practice. Mm -hmm. So I'm there and I'm watching and I'm tuning in to their, to their breath, to their expressions, mm -hmm. to their energy that's coming back to me um, and, and making sure that I'm creating an environment where people can feel um, that they are safe, mm -hmm. that they have permission to move in a way that serves them yeah. and that they have a really distinct understanding of what they should and shouldn't be feeling in their bodies, mm -hmm. that they are learning to understand their boundaries mm -hmm. more. And that, sometimes we have no idea. That's it. We're like, I don't know if I'm pushing too hard. I don't know if this feeling is the way it's meant to be feeling. That's is that what the pose looks like? Am I meant to make my body look like this? That's it. That's right? it. And that's so much of, I mean, that's that's so much of the modernization of yoga as well. And 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 that that kind of boundary that we play between what's traditional and what's you know what the pose looks like. In a book, or yeah. you know, what we what we perceive it to be, yeah. and actually what it needs to be for us, because yeah. yoga is of service to us. It yeah. is, it is a healing practice, and it's a practice that that we should be able to carry through without. We should we shouldn't be replacing things. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be replacing hips, knees, no. you know, or anything else. And, and we shouldn't have to walk away from our practice at any given time, our movement practice at any given time because something hurts. Mm. That's, a, a, that's a big one yeah. um, for me. So that long term is about can we have yoga for the rest of our life without replacing anything? Mm -hmm. Can my body still move organically in a way that serves mm -hmm. all the other facets of my being, my breath, body, my soul, my, mm -hmm. my energy? Um, and can I use movement in that way? Yeah. So that's what movement becomes about for me now. Yeah, it's a whole different thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's not It's not like learning the stuff to do the stuff. No. It's more like, how does this serve me where I am? How does it open me up? How does it soften me? How does it connect me yes. more to all that is in this yes. moment? And that sort yeah. of becomes that second fold for us of that threefold of sustainability is the short term. Mm -hmm. So every day when I set foot on my mat, how can this practice serve me today? Yeah. What do I need? What Maybe it? today it really is Shavasana. Yeah. It's Shavasana. No guilt, no expectations, no nothing, actually. Mm -hmm. um, how can I move? How can I feel? How can I connect to myself today in a way that's going to complement everything else that I'm going to do? Mm. So literally this morning before I, before I had the opportunity to come and sit down with you, it was, I was running, running mm -hmm. through my day. And yeah. um, I've got a little boy who is, he's turning five tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He's off to school on Wednesday. <gasps> The so week. yes, so yeah. yesterday was like up to my elbows in cake icing and hosting a birthday party and um, you know today was about the supermarket and this and that and it's sort of the other half of my world in my life mm -hmm. um, and so for me if I was to set foot on my mat right now for me it would probably just be simple simple movement yeah. coming back into my body because I was sort of stretched in five directions you know mm -hmm. um, 
through the first part of my day. So when I approach my mat, it's about asking myself in a really kind, simple, loving way, how can this practice be of service to you today? Mm -hmm. and, and listening to that truly, yeah. voluntarily listening to that. Do you find like an answer, like when you say, how can this practice be of service to me today? Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel an answer? Do you hear an answer? Do you see an answer? Yeah. Right? Yes, yes, and yes. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it, more so now. And I think uh, for me, it's about educating my students and my teachers to be able to find that in themselves. Yeah, because that's what I wondered, right? Yeah. Is that not everyone has that connection to no. self where they right. can actually hear what is needed. You're right. And they're like going, I don't know what's needed. I don't, I don't know. know. Do, do I need me? a down dog? Do yeah. I need a, you know? So what, what, how, do you, how, how do you work with students or teacher trainees who you're saying, you know, do what you need and they're going, but I don't know how to access what I need. Yeah. What's I think it's a, a, a couple of different things. I think the, the two words that come to mind for me straight away are um, options mm -hmm. and permission. Mm. So if I'm in a practice with my students, because of course they're still coming to class. Yeah. I'm not a mind reader, mm -hmm. although, you know, uh, it's lovely. It's lovely when a student after class says, you read my mind, yeah. you read my mind, you knew what I needed. And I'm like, well, thank you. Um, I think it is about um, laying out the energy of the practice to our students, offering umpteen ways that they can move, mm -hmm. structuring it so that those options aren't too overwhelming yeah. from moment to moment. Yeah. So, okay, let's have a look at spine rotation. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to rotate your spine, here's some options of how we can do this. Mm -hmm. um, and let's have some time and space to feel into it. If you come into something and your body communicates negatively or says, nah, no, I thought I wanted that, but I'm, I'm not sure now that I did. Okay, back up, try something else. Ask me if you need guidance. So. My practices, my classes have become much more of an open forum of movement mm -hmm. in that, um, you know, we may be standing and I'll offer, okay, well, we can stand in, in a shape that might look like a warrior pose, but do you want to move your arms in a different way? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to find a different way to be here? Mm -hmm. um, and know that at the end of that, if you'd rather spend your time in my class, um, in Shavasana, child pose, rolling around on the floor, mm. permission to do that and I'll come yeah. and, I'll, and I'll be a part of this, this space with you and we'll share our energy together no matter what you choose to do here. Yeah, it's so, a whole different way of teaching isn't it? It's a whole it, different way of like teaching. It's holding the space, being really That's clear it. on sort of some specific forms but then yeah. giving permission for people to play within that That's so they it. can do what they need. That's it. Yeah, That's which it. is so different to how used to be when it was like everyone do this and this, this, this way this, it has to this. look like this yeah and and if somebody in my class has chosen not to move in the way that I'm I'm offering out mm. it's not then about me approaching them and 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 putting an expectation such as is there something wrong with you is that why you are not moving with us in that way mm -hmm. it's actually just about stepping back and you know offering them that space to to move in another way and trusting that if they need me, they will let me know. Mm -hmm. So I'm always saying to them, please ask me if you need guidance. Know that I'm here holding the space for mm -hmm. you, but I'm not going to come and set expectation on you that you have to be standing with us or you have to be doing this or you have to be doing that. Mm -hmm. Because the rest of our life is expectation. Yeah. Everything that we do out in the world comes with some kind of expectation. You know, mm -hmm. I have to pick up my kids from school or I, I have to you know, make sure we've got clean washing, or I have to make sure that I answer my emails. But when I come to my mat and when my students come to my, come to their mats, I want that to be the place that has no expectation attached to it. It has nothing attached to it. So you can just be. Just. And be. play. And play and explore. So within that construct then, mm. how do you get around um, when people have got avoidance or resistance coming up? So for example, yeah. they're not going into something, not because it's not right for them as such, but because they're, they're avoiding it because it might be emotionally painful. Yeah, where there's a blockage. Yeah, or there's a blockage. Or, so how do you navigate that, right? So it's not too loose. Sometimes you can feel it. Sometimes you can feel it energetically. If, yeah. if I can feel if something, you know, if a, if a shape has come up and somebody's sort of, their, their face changes, their breath yeah. changes, their body language changes. Um, again, maybe that's not the place that day 
mm -hmm. for me to approach them and put that expectation on them that they should um, move through fear. But maybe it's about just saying to them, this is a safe space to explore and I am here to support you. Mm. And if it is something that's coming up for you and it's keeping the dialogue wide open with them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite talkative during my classes. <laughs> um, it's keeping the dialogue open with them. Yeah. So, you know, if you are feeling something coming up here, that's okay because mm. this is a safe space mm -hmm. for you to, to laugh, to cry, to be afraid, yeah. to try things, to fail, to, you know, to watch what happens to your own response and to see if you can shift reaction to response. So if you are reacting here, notice that in yourself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will open up to you straight away and sometimes they won't. Mm -hmm. um, but my hope for them is if they don't, that they know that they can. Yeah. They know that they can. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's where I leave it with them at that point mm -hmm. because that's where their boundary is today. Yeah. Yeah, I see. So you might feel what's going on, but you're kind of attuning to whether they step in or not, whether mm -hmm. they choose to. Yeah. yeah. I think that I think people need to have the need to be re-empowered with choice. Yeah, that's what it you feels know? like. It's like I'm really giving agency back to the students. Yeah. Like they own their body. Yeah. They own their yoga. They own their experience. And that yoga is all encompassing. So their experience that's coming up for them, it, it, it's, it could be physiological, energetic, emotional, spiritual. It's, it's all those facets. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it is about, about embodying ourselves and with the ownership of, mm -hmm. of yoga. And that all that we really share in this space is the shared space of community. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I wanted to provide here. Mm. Now, how does that translate into a teacher training environment? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah you, that's going to be my next question. <laughs> Was that your next right? question? Like, well, like, well, I'm um, curious because on a teacher training environment, yeah. you've got students over a period of time that are committed to doing the deeper work. Yeah. So I guess there's more, I'm guessing there's more room to then work with them on those deeper levels. Totally, totally. And, and, and I want to be able to train my teachers to be able to provide that same thing. And, and they sort of mm. say to me, oh, you know, I say it takes takes time. So give yourself time. I mean, I've I've been at this for sixteen, 16 years. years. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I don't have I don't have that expectation on my my teachers as well. However, the I guess the overlying theme of the work that we do in the teacher training environment, when it comes to their own practice, mm -hmm. as well as how I'm guiding them to to share yoga, to teach yoga, is offering themselves and their students that same permission. And they'll say to me, oh, well, well, how do you hold that space in that way? Um, and I see it happen with them. They, they don't think that it happens for them straight away on the training. But I, I see them embodying that permission in the way that they're vocalizing and verbalizing yoga. Yeah. It does come through mm -hmm. almost straight away. And I think it's because we lay that groundwork. Mm -hmm. So we start our teacher training with teaching the foundational work for body movement. And I will show them um, that this is what a shape kind of feels like, and this is what it looks like in a photo, but you do not have to recreate that. Mm -hmm. As long as you're playing safely with your body and you're being sensible with the way that you're moving your body. Mm -hmm. And that structurally, when we look at the, the biomechanics of the way the body moves, yeah. as long as it's making sense and it's an intelligent way to move in your body, then explore that. Here's, here's a, an outline, here's a template. So I do mm -hmm. give them a, a structured template to work with, but then it's about offering their students the opportunity to feel rather than see. Mm -hmm. So for them as teachers, it's about getting off of their mat and rather than doing a, you know, have a look at this and follow me, yeah. it's about learning to verbalize that instruction and learning to verbalize that permission mm -hmm. um, from the beginning, from mm -hmm. the get go as teachers. It's such a big shift in the yoga world. It is. It you know, is. like in the last decade, there has been such wow. a, a shift, right? Especially yes. with all the, the injury stuff that came up over the last two, three, four years. Yoga it's Body really. got published, and then trauma yeah. yoga, and that whole movement around trauma it's yoga, it. inclusivity, yeah. working with different bodies. Yeah. Ten years ago, there was an article um, out in the New York Times called How Yoga Can Wreck Your Body. Was that 10 years ago? Is that now? About, yeah, that was 10 years ago now. It was just, it was, I feel like it was just when we landed here. 
right. Yeah. How yoga can wreck your How body. How yoga can wreck your body. And of course, in a place like New York, in a place like Manhattan, where millions of people are practicing yoga and thousands of teachers are out there and spreading their message, um, that was a real shock to the system. Mm. And I think for a lot of us, that that really hit home. And it, shifting the way we practice and the way we teach wasn't because of those things coming up. Yeah. It was actually because we were feeling it and experiencing it in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So shifting the way that I practiced and the way that I teach was more about watching um, what I needed from my body unfold. Yeah. And watching what I needed, what my students needed. I mean, you know, so I sit and look at, at, at my my demographic of students that are coming in for yoga, the, mm -hmm. the moms, the desk workers, yeah. the retired folks, the career people, the, and, I, and, I, and I see a mirror. Because just because I, I'm a yogi doesn't mean that, I mean, the other half of my life, I'm a mom. Yeah, running and a business. Running right? a business, yeah. and I'm sitting at my yeah. computer for hours a day, yeah, and true. I am carrying, <laughs> like today I had this moment where I was, thinking about spending the afternoon with you and, and literally carrying like, you know, 12 bags of groceries at the same time, thinking, you know, I always say to my partner, it's, it's never the yoga that does the harm. It's the, it's, you know, trying to open the front door, holding the 12 yeah. bags of groceries. And I, and I look at what people need from yoga, people that sit at a desk all day, people that drive their cars, people that carry their babies, people that, um, that's, whose bodies are continuing every day. It's like driving a new car off the lot. Every day we wake up and our body's a day older. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's how can the practice continue to authentically serve us every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's that sort of second fold of sustainability. And the, th the third fold of sustainability for me, it came about because I was sitting talking with one of my teachers one day. And, and we were talking about um, tradition versus modernization of yoga. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something something that was really important for for my teachers and students to understand was that adapting yoga practice was not about turning our backs on tradition. Mm. We use a lot of Sanskrit in our practice and in our teaching here at Jaya. Um, we still focus on philosophy under the eight month path of yoga, and so it's not about. And for me, yoga is a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. It's not for everybody, and I recognize that. For me, it is my spiritual lifeline. Um, so it wasn't about turning our back on tradition in terms of modernizing the way that we see um, asana or pranayama or meditation as a, mm -hmm. as a moderate practice. It's that brahmacharya that comes right through, mm -hmm. you know, because I might not have the time nor need um, an elongated, excessive practice of yoga. For me, I might need 10 minutes of movement and a bit of breath and, and a few moments in stillness mm -hmm. to carry me through my day. Um, so, what's interesting too is that we don't really know yeah. how asana was practiced traditionally. We don't. Really we only really it. know from maybe the last what's hundred years. To us. Yeah, yeah, which is only yeah. the last hundred years or so, and and that doesn't necessarily do with how it used to be done. Um, and right. what I'm noticing from my own practice is that I don't do a lot of asana anymore. Yeah. It's free flow movement as required, and then pranayama meditation. And more, it's more and more the moment to moment off the mat engaging, like witnessing yes. myself sitting here on the couch, yes. having a conversation with you, yeah. noticing if there's any fluctuations in the field. That's it. You know, and then it's, I think, so when I look at yoga and how people are approaching it, my question is, what is it that you require from it? Yeah. Are you coming to yoga because you need more stillness? Are you coming to yoga because you want to be able to move your body freely? Are you coming to yoga because you're ready to wake the fuck up? Yeah, that's right? it. That's it. You're finally ready for you're the like, awakening. I want to wake up. Yeah. Um, and yoga will always meet you where you are. It, it will. You know, it whatever will. it is that you need, yoga yeah. will be there. And it will, you know, you come into yoga because you want to do epic handstands. <laughs> that's right? it. Yoga, that's it. It'll do it'll, that. It'll do that for you. Totally. It'll do that for you. Yeah. Yoga will, yeah, yoga will serve you in whatever way you need it in the moment if you open yourself up to the listening. Mm -hmm. And if you trust it, mm. you trust that process of unfolding. And it differs from day to day. It differs in, 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 from moment to moment. Yeah. And it differs through phases of our life. 
Yeah. You know? I mean, I know when I first had my son, yeah. you know, yoga nidra, and I got super. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, I loved it. Like I did so much yoga nidra, and it was yeah. so powerful for my system. Yeah. But I don't do so much nidra anymore. No. Because you know? today it's something it's, else. It's something. Or, something else. Yeah. It's the extended shavasana before sleep. Yeah. Where I'm softening and softening and softening and seeing how much I can soften the nervous system. Yeah. You know. For me at the moment, it's mantra. Mm. Lots of mantra. And um, lots of chanting. Uh -huh. What and are you chanting? What are your favorites? Ad Gure Name. Ad Gure Name. Ad Gure Name. Sat Gure Name. Sere Guru Deve Name. It's the mantra for protection. Uh -huh. It's about protecting my energy body because I, I'm a giver mm -hmm. in my world. I give to my children, mm -hmm. I give to my partner, I give to my students, I give to my teachers. When you're, when you're in a job of, of giving, although most days I wake up and, and don't consider what I do for a living a job. No, yeah, I know, I know how you feel. <laughs> it's a way of being. Like gratitude, but, yeah. Yeah, gratitude, gratitude pinching the yeah. whole nine yards. I get to do this every day. Really? Yeah. I get, I, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, universe. You too can do this, teacher training. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it, is, it is a pinchable moment every day yeah. to wake up and, and be able to give and to be able to watch transformation in people and be able to watch the joy, the yeah. joy coming oh, in. It's just, my heart is so yeah. warmed by that. You know um, the looks I had before class? Yeah. And then how people are like radiating oh. after class? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's it, that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and glow. you realize too, I realize that, that all I'm providing is a platform for them to find that. They're fine. It's them doing it. Yeah. But they think we're the doing it. They need the space. Yeah. And they, like you said, they need the space, they need the options, and they need permission. That's it. And so as That's teachers, it. facilitators, we're offering that. We're modeling a way to be. They walk in and they're like, oh my God, that person's glowing. I want what she's got. I want what she's got. And yeah. what I, you know, and what we've got is just, is that, is that same thing of just, you know, space, stillness, mm. war, a warm, safe environment to be vulnerable. Yeah. To drop in. To drop it. Yeah, to drop absolutely. It. So, yes, you too can have it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love it because I wanted to ask you about your practice and how mm. it shifted and changed over the years because I think that's really important to recognize as well is that we don't do the same thing all the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and so you said you started yeah. with vinyasa, vinyasa, vinyasa. Vinyasa, vinyasa, vinyasa. And, and that was even my self practice. Yeah. Because I think it just, it that was the, that was the mirror and the, the self-practice and the classwork and the day-to-day -day yeah. are actually like this triple mirror, aren't they? So coming to Matt in self-practice was a reflection of what kind of classwork I was eager to drop into at the time. And it also shined the mirror on my day. I was I was fast-paced. I was fast-moving. I was living in Manhattan. I was yang in my energy. I was, you know, Matt on the back sipping a coffee and, you know. <laughs> and go, 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 go. Go, go, go. And, and it was... It was I was in a yang place in my life, so I was I was ambitious and I was yeah. driven, and I was still in a really ambitious place in my career as well. And so yoga was just kind of it was sliding into that, yeah. but in a really really yang way. And um, don't get me wrong, though, I really I still have a place in my life and in my world for a yang practice. Mm. It's it, you don't have to have one or the other. I think no. that's really important for people to understand as well. Is that, it's what's needed, right? Yeah, and, and, yeah. That, and that becoming a master of your own self is, is not about, um, you know, you don't become a master of yoga because, because you do less asana or because you don't do a handstand anymore. Because it's not about becoming more still in a long term. It's actually just about trusting what needs to be in the moment. And sometimes I do need a handstand. Yeah. Man, do I need a handstand. Yeah. Um, against the wall, mainly. <laughs> but um, I think that's it. What you just said, master yeah. yourself is surrendering to what's needed in the moment. That's no it. attachment, no yeah. aversion. Just this is needed and this is what I surrender to. Yeah. And there are definite, nowadays there are definite don'ts in my practice. I do have definite don'ts and I have definite parameters around um, maybe ways that I used to move my body that I won't anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and that detachment comes from just knowing that actually that, 
that's not going to serve me because it's actually doing more harm than good. Mm. And now I, knowing what I know too about the structure of our bodies and what they can manage from day to day, there are a few definite don'ts yeah. for me in my practice and there are definite don'ts for me as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so things you just don't teach anymore? Yeah, or what? there are things that I don't teach anymore. Do you, you want to yeah, know? Yeah, don't I want to know. <laughs> you want to like, know. What don't you um, teach anymore? I don't teach headstand. Uh-huh. So no, no more headstand. I don't teach headstand anymore. However, um, I think it's important to put out there at the same time that I don't, I don't judge people who do or teach. Yeah. You know, because everybody is on their journey. And, there, and our journeys aren't forward or backward, our journeys are sideways. Mm -hmm. Our journeys have all these forks in the road. So it's not about, um, well, when you get to this path in your journey, um, and we hear, that, we hear that so much as practitioners and teachers too, when you get to this path in your, your journey, you might master this shape. Or when you get to this path in your journey, you might detach from this shape and that makes you the master. Um, it's not about that. I think mm -hmm. it's about your own recognition of of what serves you and as a teacher for me it's about recognizing what serves my students yeah. structurally yeah. and if I really am going to put a stamp on on creating a safe and sustainable environment in terms of structure mm -hmm. of what our body needs anatomically for me I let go of headstand as a teacher because I look at this body the body that the body that sits, sits yeah. at the desk the body that's kind of de-evolutionizing in a way um, the body that is, um, you know, sitting for 10 hours a day. And I, I do have to look at the structure of that body and go, okay, do we need an extreme movement in any given direction? Mm -hmm. Do we need upward facing dog anymore? Mm. Or do we just need to move in our yeah. range of motion through back bend yeah. without using our arms as a strong and potentially forceful lever? Yeah. You know? Can I, can I ask my students to come onto their bellies and move in the range of motion of their spine, however big or small it is, mm -hmm. without using their arms as a lever, using mm -hmm. them as support rather than force? Yeah. Yeah? So about educating them about finding their range of motion. Yeah. Because outside of, of our patterns of movement and how much of it we have in our bodies, mm -hmm. we also all have a different structure don't we? Yeah, we all have a, different. you know, some of our spinal vertebra might be closer together or further away and that might give us more range of motion naturally. Yeah. Um, backtracking to headstand, I guess for me it's about, I tried for a couple of years saying to my students, okay, let's have, let's have an inversion on our forearms that doesn't put pressure on our head. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, if you're going to headstand, I'd like to be able to slide a piece of paper mm. between your head and the floor. Mm -hmm. Well then little by little I watched that turn into Pinchamayarasana, the forearm balance, mm. and us actually using the structure of our upper body, which can potentially be, um, you know, a healthy weight there to support our bones without putting the weight and pressure on the cervical spine, which mm -hmm. This, this structure of thoracic really spine and this structure yeah. of head can't take the weight bear of our body anymore. Um, so it's about looking at the structure of our bodies today and going, mm. just because we can, perhaps doesn't mean we should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Um, so to, to wrap this up, let's go back to your teacher training because you've got one starting 2019 at the beginning yep, of the year and you've we'll got have space. It. Yep, we, we do. We'll have a 200 hour and a 300 hour. So we welcome um, anybody who's keen to deepen their understanding of yoga, the structure mm. of the way that we do training. We do um, the 200 hour is over the course of seven weekends. It's a seven month course. Mm -hmm. um, so one weekend a month? One weekend a month. Yep. Time it, to integrate. That's it. Time yeah. to integrate. We give you work to integrate on the in-between. Um, but it also fits into daily life. So if you're a full-time career person, if you're a mom, um, whatever you're juggling and balancing in your world, you can fit this in. Mm -hmm. You can look at it as, as seven little mini workshops stepping away from your life and into yeah. an environment to understand your own practice on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Or... If you're thinking about sharing yoga and, and whether you're thinking about sharing yoga um, to friends and family, mm. whether you're thinking about 
um, just sharing it in your community, or whether you're looking at the bigger picture, we can provide this as an opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. And then of course the 300 hour courses for our teachers out there. So come back, come back into the learning environment because it never stops, does it? No, it never it stops. It never stops. Um, so providing a space for, um, for teachers to come back into the environment mm -hmm. and to grow. So those people on the 300 hour, they have to have done a 200 somewhere in Yes, um, somewhere, well, we're, uh, we're uh, um, attributed to, we're, we're um, we're in coordination with Yoga Alliance, so we're yeah. a, a global accreditation. And I do that so that if people are traveling through and they want to take their yoga or they want to go outside of New Zealand, um, having something like the, the Yoga Alliance accreditation, it translates into North America and places like that. We are such a transient world nowadays. Yeah, everyone's going somewhere. Everybody's going somewhere. So, um, yeah, so you need to have done a 200 hour course with. With another yoga alliance, alliance accredited gotcha. school yep. to have that recognition but you don't need to necessarily be accredited with yoga alliance to come and study with us mm -hmm. so even if you've done your 200 hour with another school who's not necessarily uh, associated with yoga alliance that was yeah. the word i was looking for yeah associated with yoga alliance um, you can come and train with us and you don't need to necessarily associate yourself with Yoga Alliance as well. Mm -hmm. It's just if you want to have that, that R-O-Y-T accreditation. Extra rubber stamp. Yeah, that's it. That's mm -hmm. it. So, but please do. Yeah, you can still come and train with us um, at the 200 hour level if you're new or at the 300 hour level if you have had some training before. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's the best thing for you about sharing that journey with the people? Like the seven months. Well, yeah, what do you love most oh, about it? Oh, it's just um, those who have come to train with me before always have a bit of a laugh with me because I will sit at the start of each training weekend, which they are um, they are modeled by theme. So we start by building the foundation of asana, and then we start looking at communication and the breath work, the meditation, the philosophy, and we build. We build into women's health. We build into yin yoga, restorative yoga, uh, yoga therapy. Um, anatomy and physiology and each month I sit with my my trainees and I say to them this is my favorite weekend <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of grown into a bit of a joke here it's at Jaya every because every weekend yeah. is my favorite weekend I feel like at the start of the journey I have all these secrets that I want to share mm. and I still it still feels for me it feels very pure and it feels childlike and it feels mm. um, I get so excited to sit down with a new group and, and share yeah. those secrets because yeah. they're not secrets for me to keep, but they're things that will unfold for them that I can't tell them about straight away, mm -hmm. but that they will find on their journey. Mm. And to watch all of that unfold, even after years of teacher training, it still, it is, it is my dharma. It is my purpose. Yeah. It is what um, just just lights keeps you up. me coming back and yeah. lights me up and, and brings me an immense amount of pinchable gratitude and joy every single day. I can feel that. <laughs> and I know that whenever we publish um, on the Facebook page, whenever we publish mm. one of your old articles or the last interview, there's always a couple of teacher trainees or students that will always comment, oh my God, Jennifer's the best, I love oh. her so much. And I, it's like this love and I can feel it from you now. like the passion and the love, it's a little bit like, like a mama bear. You, yeah. You know, it's like yeah. I can feel what it would be like to come and do the training with you and that sense of really being held and that, that kind of mama bear sense. I think it comes right through. I think yeah. it comes right through because of course I'm a, mom, I'm a mama bear in my world. Yeah. Um, but also, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm a kapha, uh, I'm an earth mother by nature. Um, but my trainees, I, I, they're my family. Yeah. They're my community. My students here at Jaya, they're my community. This studio is in my community. Mm. I live up the road. And um, for me, it was about creating sana. It's about, yeah. about creating community. And it's with students, but also um, with my teachers. And it, and it never ends when they walk away with their mm. certificate. This, this is their home. And I see it when they come back in the door. They come back and there's a, there's a sense of coming home. Yeah. And um, so once it begins, it never ends. You know, we, we just keep growing our family, and for me, it's just, it's one of the most meaningful, meaningful parts of my life and my world, is to be able to create that and to be able to hold that space. Mm. 
It's so awesome. I can feel it in you. It's so you down. We had the most wonderful cuddle as well when when we met for the yeah, first time today. I know. Um, and it just, yeah, it, it, it brought me so much joy to invite you into our community yeah, today. It was so beautiful to finally come here after all these years. After all these years of sort of virtual years. emails and video and and to actually have this opportunity and, and for you, Carolee, to be creating this opportunity for us yeah. in the yoga community is just, we are so very grateful. Oh, so thank my you. My pleasure. I love a good old yoga conversation. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Alrighty. So we're going to wrap that up. Um, unless anyone has any questions, you can fire one into the comments right now and got any questions for Jennifer on Jaya Yoga, on what it means to be uh, sustainable. It's a sustainable yoga practice. Mm. Um, and while you guys are thinking about questions, we have some chocolates here. Are oh, we going to eat one of these? these? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Right, There's so a local cafe that's just up the road that makes these gorgeous. This is just a raw vegan chocolate. Mm -hmm. And this is a raw vegan raspberry truffle. Oh my God. All right. Let's start with I couldn't more. decide, so I just went vegan with chocolate. Here we go. Uh-huh. Mmm. Mmm. Oh my God. Mmm. I just oh. love that, that bitterness. Mm -hmm. That like... Cacao, but I must and that texture. Mm. Give us the name of the cafe. We're in Birkenhead mm. right now. It's Mana, M A N N A, Mana, and Mana. it's just down in Mokoya mm. Road. Oh my god! And he's doing amazing things with um, with beverages and with food. Um, he's got a a rainbow mm. of different kinds of beverages that you can have, and um, you know, the pink one is to is beetroot, and the yellow one is turmeric, and he's got. Um, just beautiful, beautiful, and everything sustainable. He's got. This is the yeah. new world. It's the new world. This is the future. Sustainable. You can get vegan, vegan, mm. vegan or vegan. I don't know. Vegan? Do you? I don't know either. I guess it's a North American. Well, how would you say it in North America? Vegan. Vegan. All right, we'll mm. say vegan. You can buy vegan chocolate mm. in Birkenhead now. You can buy elsewhere. vegan chocolate, and you can Ooh. have you know sustainable yoga. I love it. All in one place. Yay. It's a one-stop shop. <laughs> Come over to Birkenhead. Come and see us. We know we're over the bridge. But, you know, first, not first exit over the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. It's so worth it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for thank inviting you. me into your couch and into your studio. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Carolee. And thank you for all the amazing work that you are doing out there, spreading our, our, all of our messages of yoga. My pleasure. All right. Thank you for those of you who have watched now live and for those of you that are going to watch it afterwards. Big love to you all.